Putting his Gladstone bag on the coffee table, Dr. Graham crossed to the settee and sat down. I'm afraid this is a bad business, Monsieur Poirot, he announced to the detective. A bad business, you say? You have discovered what caused the death of Sir Claude? asked Poirot. His death was due to poisoning by a powerful vegetable alkaloid, Graham declared. Such as... Hyocene, perhaps? Poirot suggested, picking up the tin box of drugs from the table. Why, yes, exactly. Dr. Graham sounded surprised at the detective's accurate surmise. Poirot took the case to the other side of the room, placing it on the gramophone table, and Hastings followed him there. Meanwhile, Richard Amory joined the doctor on the settee. What does this mean, actually? Richard asked Dr. Graham. Oh, for one thing, it means the involvement of the police, was Graham's prompt reply. Oh, my God, exclaimed Richard, this is terrible. Can't you possibly hush it up? Dr. Graham looked at Richard Amory steadily before he spoke slowly and deliberately. My dear Richard, he said, believe me, nobody could be more pained and grieved at this horrible calamity than I am, especially since, under the circumstances, it does not seem likely that the poison could have been self-administered. Richard paused for several seconds before he spoke. Are you saying it was murder? he asked in an unsteady voice. Dr. Graham did not speak, but nodded solemnly. Murder! exclaimed Richard. What on earth are we going to do? Adopting a brisker, more businesslike manner, Graham explained the procedure to be followed. I have notified the coroner. The inquest will be held tomorrow at the King's Arms. And you mean the, the, the police will have to be involved? There's no way out of it? There is not. Surely you must realize that, Richard, said Dr. Graham. Richard's tone was frantic as he began to explain, but why didn't you warn me? Now, come on, Richard, take a hold of yourself. I'm sure you understand that I have only taken such steps as I thought absolutely necessary, Graham interrupted him. After all, no time should be lost in matters of this kind. My God, exclaimed Richard. Dr. Graham addressed Amory in a kindlier tone. Richard, I know, I do understand. This has been a terrible shock to you, but there are things I must ask you about. Do you feel equal to answering a few questions? Richard made a visible effort to pull himself together. What do you want to know? he asked. First of all, said Graham, what food and drink did your father have at dinner last night? Or let's see, we all had the same. Soup, fried sole, cutlets, and we finished off with a fruit salad. Now what about drink? continued Dr. Graham. Richard considered for a moment before replying, well, my father and my aunt drank burgundy, and so did Raynor, I think. I stuck with whiskey and soda, and uh, Dr. Corelli, yes, Dr. Corelli drank white wine throughout the meal. Ah, oh, yes, the mysterious Dr. Corelli, Graham murmured. You'll excuse me, Richard, but how much precisely do you know about this man? Interested to hear Richard Amory's reply to this, Hastings moved closer to the two men. In answer to Dr. Graham, Richard declared, I know nothing about him. I never met him or even heard of him until yesterday. But he is a friend of your wife? asked the doctor. Well, apparently he is. Does she know him intimately? Oh, no, he's a mere acquaintance, I gather. Graham made a little clicking sound with his tongue and shook his head. You've not allowed him to leave the house, I hope, he asked. No, no. Richard assured him. I pointed out to him last night that, until this matter was cleared up, the business of the formula being stolen, I mean, it would be best for him to remain here at the house. In fact, I sent down to the inn where he had a room and had his things brought up here. Didn't he make any protest at all? Graham asked in some surprise. Oh, no, in fact, he agreed quite eagerly. Hmm, was Graham's only response to this. Then, looking about him, he asked, well, now, what about this room? Poirot approached the two men. The doors were locked last night by Treadwell the butler, he assured Dr. Graham, and the keys were given to me. Everything is exactly as it was, except that we have moved the chairs, as you see. Dr. Graham looked at the coffee cup on the table. Pointing to it, he asked, Is that the cup? He went across to the table, picked up the cup, and sniffed at it. Richard, he asked, is this the cup your father drank from? I'd better take it. It'll have to be analysed. Carrying the cup over to the coffee table, he opened his bag. Richard sprang to his feet. 
Well, surely you don't think— He began, but then broke off. It seems highly unlikely, Graham told him, that the poison could have been administered at dinner. The most likely explanation is that the hyacinth was added to Sir Claude's coffee. I, I— Richard tried to utter as he rose and took a step towards the doctor, but then broke off with a despairing gesture and left the room abruptly through the French windows into the garden. Dr. Graham took a small cardboard box of cotton wool from his bag and carefully packed the cup in it, talking to Poirot as he did so. A nasty business, he confided. I am not at all surprised that Richard Amory is upset. The newspapers will make the most of this Italian doctor's friendship with his wife, and mud tends to stick, Monsieur Poirot, mud tends to stick. Poor lady. She was probably wholly innocent. The man obviously made her acquaintance in some plausible way. They're astonishingly clever, these foreigners. Of course, I suppose I shouldn't be talking this way as though the thing were a foregone conclusion, but what else is one to imagine? You think it leaps to the eye, yes? Poirot asked him, exchanging glances with Hastings. Well, after all, Dr. Graham explained, Sir Claude's invention was valuable. This foreigner comes along, of whom nobody knows anything, an Italian. Sir Claude is mysteriously poisoned. Ah, yes, the butchers, exclaimed Poirot. I beg your pardon? asked the doctor. Nothing, nothing. Dr. Graham picked up his bag and prepared to leave, holding out his hand to Poirot. Oh, well, I'd best be off. Goodbye for the present, Monsieur le Docteur, said Poirot as they shook hands. At the door, Graham paused and looked back. Goodbye, Monsieur Poirot. You will see that nobody disturbs anything in this room until the police arrive, won't you? That's extremely important. Most certainly, I shall make myself responsible for it, Poirot assured him. As Graham left, closing the door behind him, Hastings observed dryly, You know, Poirot, I shouldn't like to be ill in this house. For one thing, there appears to be a poisoner at loose in the place, and for another, I'm not at all sure I'd trust that young doctor. Poirot gave Hastings a quizzical look. Let us hope that we will not be in this house long enough to become ill, he said, moving to the fireplace and pressing the bell. And now, my dear Hastings, to work, he announced as he rejoined his colleague, who was contemplating the coffee table with a puzzled expression. "'What are you going to do?' Hastings asked. "'You and I, my friend,' replied Poirot with a twinkle in his eye, "'are going to interview Cesare Borgia.' Treadwell entered in response to Poirot's call. "'You rang, sir?' the butler asked. "'Yes, Treadwell. Will you please ask the Italian gentleman, Dr. Carrelli, if he would be kind enough to come here?' "'Certainly, sir,' Treadwell replied. He left the room, and Poirot went to the table to pick up the case of drugs. "'It would be well, I think,' he confided to Hastings, "'if we were to put this box of so very dangerous drugs back in its proper place. Let us, above all things, be neat and orderly.' Handing the tin box to Hastings, Poirot took a chair to the bookcase and climbed onto it. Oh, the old cry for neatness and symmetry, eh? Hastings exclaimed. Well, there's more to it than that, I imagine. What do you mean, my friend? asked Poirot. I know what it is. You don't want to scare Corelli. After all, who handled those drugs last night? Amongst others, he did. If he saw them down on the table, it might put him on his guard, eh, Poirot? Poirot tapped Hastings on the head. How astute is my friend Hastings, he declared, taking the case from him. I know you too well, Hastings insisted. You can't throw dust in my eyes. As Hastings spoke, Poirot drew a finger along the top of the bookshelf, sweeping dust down into his friend's upturned face. It seems to me, my dear Hastings, that that is precisely what I have done, Poirot exclaimed as he gingerly drew a finger along the shelf again, making a grimace as he did so. It appears that I have prized the domestics too soon. This shelf is thick with dust. I wish I had a good wet duster in my hand to clean it up. My dear Poirot, Hastings laughed, you're not a housemaid. Alas, no, observed Poirot sadly, I am only a detective. Well, it's nothing to detect up there, Hastings declared, so get down. As you say, there is nothing, Poirot began, and then stopped dead standing quite still on the chair as though turned to stone. "'What is it?' Hastings asked him impatiently, 
adding, Do get down, Poirot. Dr. Corelli will be here at any minute. You don't want him to find you up there, do you? You are right, my friend, Poirot agreed as he got down slowly from the chair. His face wore a solemn expression. What on earth's the matter? asked Hastings. It is that I am thinking of something, Poirot replied with a faraway look in his eyes. What are you thinking of? Dust, Hastings. Dust, said Poirot in an odd voice. The door opened and Dr. Carelli entered the room. He and Poirot greeted each other with the greatest of ceremony, each politely speaking the other's native tongue. Ah, Monsieur Poirot, Carelli began, vous voulez me questionner? Si, Signor Dottore, si le permette, Poirot replied. Ah, le parla italiano. Si, ma preferisco parlare in francese. Alors, said Carelli, qu'est-ce que vous voulez me demander? I say, Hastings interjected with a certain irritation in his voice, what the devil is all this? Ah, the poor Hastings is not a linguist. I had forgotten, Poirot smiled. We had better speak English. I beg your pardon, of course, Corelli agreed. He addressed Poirot with an air of great frankness. I am glad that you have sent for me, Monsieur Poirot, he declared. Had you not done so, I should myself have requested an interview. Indeed, remarked Poirot, indicating a chair by the table. Carelli sat while Poirot seated himself in the armchair, and Hastings made himself comfortable on the settee. Yes, the Italian doctor continued, as it happens I have business in London of an urgent nature. Pray continue, Poirot encouraged him. Yes, of course, I quite appreciated the position last night. A valuable document has been stolen. I was the only stranger present. Naturally, I was only too willing to remain, to permit myself to be searched, in fact, to insist on being searched. As a man of honor, I could do nothing else. Quite so, Poirot agreed. But today? Today is different, replied Corelli. I have, as I say, urgent business in London. And uh, you wish to take your departure? Exactly. It seems most reasonable, Poirot declared. Do you not think so, Hastings? Hastings made no reply, but looked as though he did not think it at all reasonable. Perhaps a word from you, Monsieur Poirot, to Mr. Amory would be in order. Carelli suggested. I should like to avoid any unpleasantness. My good officers are at your disposal, monsieur le docteur, Poirot assured him. And now, perhaps you can assist me with one or two details. I should be only too happy to do so, Carelli replied. Poirot considered for a moment before asking, Is Madame Richard Amory an old friend of yours? A very old friend, said Carelli. He sighed. It was a delightful surprise to running across us so unexpectedly in this uh, out-of-the-way spot. Unexpectedly, you say? Poirot asked. Quite unexpectedly, Carelli replied with a quick glance at the detective. Quite unexpectedly, Poirot repeated. Fancy that. A certain tension had crept into the atmosphere. Carelli looked at Poirot sharply but said nothing. You are interested in the latest discoveries of science? Poirot asked him. Certainly. I am a doctor. Ah, but that does not quite follow, surely, Poirot observed. A new vaccine, a new ray, a new germ, all this, yes, but a new explosive? Surely that is not quite the province of a doctor of medicine. Science should be of interest to all of us, Carelli insisted. It represents the triumph of man over nature. Man wrings his secrets from nature in spite of her bitter opposition. Poirot nodded his head in agreement. It is indeed admirable what you say there. It is poetic, but, as my friend Hastings reminded me just now, I am only a detective. I appreciate things from a more practical standpoint. This discovery of Sir Claude's, it was worth a great amount of money, eh? Possibly. Carelli's tone was dismissive. I have not given that side of the matter much thought. You are evidently a man of lofty principles, observed Poirot, and also, no doubt, a man of means. Travelling, for instance, is an expensive hobby. One should see the world one lives in, said Carelli dryly. 
Indeed, Quarrow agreed. And the people who live in it? Curious people, some of them. The thief, for instance. What a curious mentality he must have. As you say, Corelli agreed, most curious. And the blackmailer, Quarrow continued. What do you mean? Corelli asked sharply. I said the blackmailer, Quarrow repeated. There was an awkward pause before he continued. But we are wandering from our subject. The death of Sir Claude Emery. The death of Sir Claude Emery? Why is that our subject? Ah, of course, Quarrow recalled. You do not yet know. I am afraid that Sir Claude did not die as though he sat of a heart attack. He was poisoned. He watched the Italian closely for his reaction. Ah, murmured Corelli with a nod of the head. That does not surprise you? asked Poirot. Frankly, no, Corelli replied. I suspected as much last night. You see, then, Poirot continued, that the matter has become much more serious. His tone changed. You will not be able to leave the house today, Dr. Calhelli. Leaning forward to Poirot, Corelli asked, Do you connect Sir Claude's death with the stealing of the formula? Certainly, Poirot replied. Do not you? Corelli spoke quickly and urgently. Is there no one in this house, no member of his family, who desired the death of Sir Claude, quite apart from any questions of the formula? What does his death mean to most of the people in this house? I will tell you. It means freedom, Monsieur Poirot. Freedom. And what do you mention just now? Money. That old man was a tyrant, and apart from his beloved work, he was a miser. Did you observe all this last night, Monsieur le Docteur? asked Poirot innocently. What have I did? replied Corelli. I have eyes. I can see. At least three of the people in this house wanted Sir Claude out of the way. He rose and looked at the clock on the mantelpiece. But that does not concern me now. Hastings leaned forward, looking very interested, as Corelli continued, I am vexed that I cannot keep my appointment in London. I am desolated, Monsieur le Docteur, said Poirot, but what can I do? Well, then, you have no further need of me, asked Corelli. For the moment, no, Poirot told him. Dr. Corelli moved to the door. I will tell you one thing more, Monsieur Poirot, he announced, opening the door and turning back to face the detective. There are some women whom it is dangerous to drive too far. Poirot bowed to him politely, and Corelli returned his bow somewhat more ironically before making his exit. When Corelli had left the room, Hastings stared after him for a few moments. I say, Poirot, he asked finally, what do you think he meant by that? Poirot shrugged his shoulders. It was a remark of no consequence, he declared. But Poirot, Hastings persisted, I'm sure Corelli was trying to tell you something. Ring a bell once more, Hastings, was the little detective's only response. Hastings did as he was bidden, but could not refrain from a further inquiry. What are you going to do now? Poirot's reply was in his most enigmatic vein. You will see, my dear Hastings. Patience is a great virtue. Treadwell entered the room again with his usual respectful inquiry of, Yes, sir? Poirot beamed at him genially. Ah, Treadwell, will you present my compliments to Miss Caroline Emery and ask her if she will be good enough to allow me a few minutes of her time? Certainly, sir. I thank you, Treadwell. When the butler had left, Hastings exclaimed, But the old soul's in bed. Surely you're not going to make her get up if she isn't feeling well. My friend Hastings knows everything. So, she is in bed, yes? Well, isn't she? Poirot patted his friend's shoulder affectionately. That is just what I want to find out. But surely, Hastings elaborated, don't you remember? And Richard Amory said so. The detective regarded his friend steadily. Hastings, he declared, here is a man killed. And how does his family react? With lies, lies, lies everywhere. Why does Madame Emery want me to go? Huh? Why does Monsieur Emery want me to go? Why does he wish to prevent me from seeing his aunt? 
What can she tell me that he does not want me to hear? I tell you, Hastings, what we have here is drama. Not a simple, sordid crime, but drama. Poignant, human drama. He looked as though he would have expanded on this theme, had not Miss Amory entered at that moment. Oh, Monsieur Poirot, she addressed him as she closed the door. Treadwell tells me you wanted to see me. Ah, yes, mademoiselle, Poirot declared as he went to her. It is just that I would like to ask you a few questions. Will you not sit down? He led her to a chair by the table, and she sat, looking at him nervously. But I understood that you were prostrated, ill, Poirot continued as he sat on the other side of the table and regarded her with an expression of anxious solicitude. Oh, it's all been a terrible shock, of course, Caroline Amory sighed. Really terrible. But what I always say is, somebody must keep their head. The servants, you know, are in a turmoil. Well, she continued, speaking more quickly, you know what servants are, Monsieur Poirot. They positively delight in funerals. They prefer a death to a wedding, I do believe. Now, dear Dr. Graham, he is so kind, such a comfort, a really clever doctor, and of course he's so fond of Barbara. I think it's a pity that Richard doesn't seem to care for him, but... Uh, oh, oh, what was I saying? Oh, yes, uh, um, yeah, Dr. Graham, so young, and he quite cured my neuritis last year, not that I'm often ill. Now, this rising generation doesn't seem to be at all strong, I mean, there was poor Lucia last night having to come out from a dinner feeling faint. And, of course, poor child, she's a mass of nerves. And what else can you expect with Italian blood in her veins? Though she was not so bad, I remember, when her diamond necklace was stolen. Miss Amory paused for breath. Poirot, while she was speaking, had taken out his cigarette case and was about to light a cigarette. But he paused and took the opportunity to ask her, a Madame Amory's diamond necklace was stolen? When was this, mademoiselle? Miss Amory assumed a thoughtful expression. Let me see, it must have been... Um, yes, it was two months ago, at just about the same time that Richard had such a quarrel with his father. Poirot looked at the cigarette in his hand. Uh, you permit that I smoke, mademoiselle? he asked. And on receiving a smile and a gracious nod of assent, he took a box of matches from his pocket, lit his cigarette, and looked at Miss Amory encouragingly. When that lady made no effort to resume speaking, Poirot prompted her. I think you are saying that Monsieur Emery quarrelled with his father, he suggested. Oh, it was nothing serious, Miss Amory told him. It was only over Richard's debts. Of course, all young men have debts, although indeed Claude himself was never like that. He was always so studious, even when he was a lad. Later, of course, his experiments always used up a lot of money. I used to tell him he was keeping Richard too short of money, you know. But yes, yes, about two months ago they had quite a scene, and um, what with that and Lucia's necklace missing and her refusing to call in the police, it was a very upsetting time, and so absurd, too. Nerves. All nerves. You are sure that my smoke is not deranging you, mademoiselle? asked Poirot, holding up his cigarette. Oh, no, not at all, Miss Amory assured him. I think gentlemen ought to smoke. Only now, noticing that his cigarette had failed to light properly, Poirot retrieved his box of matches from the table in front of him. Surely it is a very unusual thing for a young and beautiful woman to take the loss of her jewels so calmly? he asked as he lit his cigarette again, carefully replacing two dead matches in the box, which he then returned to his pocket. Yes, it is odd. That's what I call it, Miss Amory agreed. Distinctly odd. But there she didn't seem to care a bit. Um, oh, dear, here I am gossiping on about things which can't possibly interest you, Monsieur Poirot. But you interest me enormously, Mademoiselle, Poirot assured her. Tell me, when Madame Amory came out from dinner last night feeling faint, did she go upstairs? Oh, no, replied Caroline Amory. Oh, she came into this room. I settled her here on the sofa, and then I went back to the dining room, leaving Richard with her. Young husbands and wives, you know, Monsieur Poirot. Not that young men are nearly so romantic as they used to be when I was a girl. Oh, dear. Mm. I remember a young fellow called Aloysius Jones. We used to play croquet together. Foolish fellow, foolish fellow. 
Oh, but there, I'm wandering from the point again. No, we were talking about Richard and Lucia, a very handsome couple they make. Don't you think so, Monsieur Poirot? He met her in Italy, you know, on the Italian lakes last November. It was love at first sight. They were married within a week. She was an orphan, alone in the world. Very sad, although I sometimes wonder whether it wasn't a blessing in disguise. If she'd had a lot of foreign relations, that would be a bit trying, don't you think? After all, you know what foreigners are. They are... Oh! She suddenly broke off, turning in her chair to look at Poirot in embarrassed dismay. Oh, I, I do beg your pardon. Not at all, not at all, murmured Poirot with an amused glance at Hastings. So stupid of me, Miss Amory apologized, highly flustered. I didn't mean, uh, uh, of course, it's, it's, it's so different in your case. Les braves belges, as we used to say during the war. <laughs> Please do not concern yourself, Poirot assured her. After a pause, he continued, as though her mention of the war had reminded him, I believe, that is, I understand that uh, the box of drugs above the bookcase is a relic of the war. You were all examining it last night, were you not? Yes, that's right, so we were. Now, how did that come about? inquired Poirot. Miss Amory considered for a moment before replying, Now, how did it happen? Ah, yes, I remember. I said I wished I had some sal volatile, and Barbara got the box down to look through it, and then the gentleman came in, and Dr. Corelli frightened me to death with the things he said. Hastings began to show great interest in the turn being taken by the discussion, and Poirot prompted Miss Amory to continue. You mean the things Dr. Corelli said about the drugs? He looked through them and examined them thoroughly, I suppose? Yes. Miss Amory confirmed, and he held one glass tube up, something with the most innocent name, bromide, I think, which I've often taken for seasickness, and he said it would kill twelve strong men. Have you seen hydrobromide? asked Poirot. I beg your pardon? Was it hyacin hydrobromide that Dr. Carelli was referring to? Yes, yes, that was it, Miss Amory exclaimed. How clever of you. And then Lucia took it from him and repeated something he had said about a, a dreamless sleep. I detest this modern neurotic poetry. I always say that ever since dear Lord Tennyson died, no one has written poetry of any— Oh, dear, muttered Poirot. I beg your pardon? asked Miss Amory. Ah, uh, I was just thinking of the dear Lord Tennyson. Uh, but, uh, please go on. What happened next? Next? You were telling us about last night, here, in this room. Ah, yes, yes. Well, Barbara wanted to put on an extremely vulgar song, on the gramophone, I mean. Fortunately, I stopped her. I see, murmured Poirot. And this little tube that the doctor held up, was it full? Oh, yes, Miss Amory replied without hesitation. "'Because when the doctor made his quotation about dreamless sleep, "'he said that half the tablets in the tube would be sufficient.' "'Miss Amory got up from her chair and moved away from the table. "'You know, Monsieur Poirot,' she continued as Poirot rose to join her, "'I said all along that I didn't like that man, that Dr. Carelli. "'There's something about him not sincere and so oily in manner. "'Of course I couldn't say anything in front of Lucia, "'since he is supposed to be a friend of hers, but I did not like him. You see, Lucia is so trusting. I'm certain that the man must have wormed his way into her confidence with a view to getting asked to the house and stealing the formula. Poirot regarded Miss Amory quizzically before he asked, You have no doubt, then, that it was Dr. Carelli who stole the Saclot's formula? Miss Amory looked at the detective in surprise. Oh, dear, Monsieur Poirot, she exclaimed, who else could have done so? He was the only stranger present. Well, naturally, my brother would not have liked to accuse a guest, so he made an opportunity for the document to be returned. I thought it was very delicately done, very delicately indeed. Quite so, Poirot agreed tactfully, putting a friendly arm around Miss Amory's shoulder, to that lady's evident displeasure. Now, mademoiselle, I am going to try a little experiment in which I would like your cooperation. He removed his arm from her. Where were you sitting last night when the lights went out? There, Miss Amory declared, indicating the settee. Then would you be so good as to sit there once again? Miss Amory moved to the settee and sat. 
Now, mademoiselle, announced Poirot, I want you to make a strong effort of the imagination. Shut your eyes, if you please. Miss Amory did as she was asked. That is right, Poirot continued. Now, imagine that you are back again where you were last night. It is dark. You can see nothing. But you can hear. Throw yourself back. Interpreting his words literally, Miss Amory flung herself backwards on the settee. No, no, said Poirot. I mean, throw your mind back. What can you hear? That is like, cast your mind back. Now, tell me what you hear in the darkness. Impressed by the detective's evident earnestness, Miss Amory made an effort to do as he requested. Pausing for a moment, she then began to speak slowly and in jerks. Gasps, she said. A lot of little gasps, and then the noise of a chair falling, and a metallic kind of clink. Was it like this? asked Poirot, taking a key from his pocket and throwing it down on the floor. It made no sound, and Miss Amory, after waiting for a few seconds, declared that she could hear nothing. Well. Like this, perhaps. Poirot tried again, retrieving the key from the floor and hitting it sharply against the coffee table. Why, that's exactly the sound I heard last night, Miss Amory exclaimed. How curious. Continue, I pray, mademoiselle, Poirot encouraged her. Well, I heard Lucia scream and call out to Sir Claude, and then the knocking came on the door. That was all? You are sure? Yes, I think so. Oh, wait a minute. No, right at the beginning, there was a curious noise, like like the tearing of silk. Somebody's dress, I suppose. Whose dress do you think? asked Poirot. Well, it must have been Lucia's. It wouldn't have been Barbara's, because she was sitting right next to me, here. That is curious, murmured Poirot thoughtfully. And that really is all, Miss Amory concluded. May I open my eyes now? Oh, yes, certainly, mademoiselle. As she did so, Poirot asked her, Who poured out Sir Claude's coffee? Was it you? No, Miss Amory told him. Lucia poured out the coffee. When was that exactly? Oh, it must have been just after we were talking about those dreadful drugs. Did Mrs. Amory take the coffee to Sir Claude herself? Caroline Amory paused for thought. No. She finally decided. No? asked Poirot. Then who did? I don't know. I'm not sure. Let me see now. Oh, yes, I remember. Sir Claude's coffee cup was on the table beside Lucia's own cup. I remember that because Mr. Raynor was carrying the cup to Sir Claude in the study, and Lucia called him back and said he had taken the wrong cup, which was really very silly, because they were both exactly the same, black without sugar. So, Poirot observed, Monsieur Raynor took the coffee to Sir Claude. Yes, or at least... No, that's right. No, Richard took it from him, because Barbara wanted to dance with Mr. Rayner. Oh, so Monsieur Amory took the coffee to his father. Yes, that's correct, Miss Amory confirmed. Ah, exclaimed Poirot. Tell me, what had Monsieur Amory been doing just before that? Dancing? Oh, no, Miss Amory replied. He'd been packing away the drugs putting them all back in the box, tidily, you know. I see, I see. Sir Claude then drank his coffee in his study. Well, I suppose he began to do so, Miss Amory remembered, but he came back in here with the cup in his hand. I remember his complaining about the taste, saying that it was bitter. And I assure you, Monsieur Poirot, it was the very best coffee. I mean, a special mixture that I had ordered myself from the Army and Navy stores in London— you know, that wonderful department store in Victoria Street. It's so convenient, not far from the railway station, and I... She broke off as the door opened, and Edward Rayner entered. Am I interrupting? the secretary asked. I'm so sorry. I wanted to speak to Monsieur Poirot, but I can come back later. No, no, declared Poirot. I have finished putting this poor lady upon the rack. Miss Amory rose. I'm afraid I haven't been able to tell you anything useful, she apologized as she went to the door. 
Poirot rose and walked ahead of her. You have told me a great deal, mademoiselle. More than you realize, perhaps, he assured Miss Amory as he opened the door for her. <laughs>